Welcome to AATCM, the emergency medicine channel. Today, I'm going to talk about the procedure called pericardiosynthesis. Introduction. Let, let me introduce what is pericardiosynthesis. Basically, it's a procedure by which the fluid accumulated in the pericardium, pericardial space, uh, we drain the fluid. So, pericardial effusion is the presence of fluid within the pericardial space and it can have a number of causes. As this fluid accumulates, there will be critical point where the pericardial pressure will negatively affect the cardiac filling and causes uh, circulatory insufficiency. This specific critical point is called pericardial tamponade. Once the compensatory mechanisms begin to fail, obstructive shock ensues and a failure to restore the hemodynamics eventually leads to cardiac arrest. Only removal of fluid can stabilize the hemodynamics at this point and the procedure by which we remove the fluid is pericardiosynthesis. So, According to this following topics, I will be discussing the procedure. First, we will be talking about the indications, then contraindications and the equipment required and the procedure and the types of approaches and then the complications. Indications of pericardiosynthesis, they can be divided as diagnostic or therapeutic. In the, in the case of the diagnostic, the, uh, the purpose of doing pericardiosynthesis is to determine the cause of the pericardial effusion. And uh, we can determine the cause of this non-hemorrhagic effusions with the help of uh, biochemical markers uh, additional to the bacterial and viral cultures and with the help of gram stain. And also the fluid pH can be helpful. It can be differentiating between the inflammatory fluid and the non-inflammatory fluid because inflammatory will be more acidic, acidotic pH will be lower. And in some cases where you're suspecting a specific cause, additional diagnostic testings can be done like adenosine DMNIs if you're suspecting TB and carcinoembryonic antigen CEA in those suspecting to have malignancy. Next, regarding the therapeutic pericardiosynthesis, this is done when we find large pericardial effusions like greater than 20 mm in a stable patient or if the patient is remaining hypotensive despite fluid resuscitation, then they'll be requiring urgent therapeutic drainage. There's other use of therapeutic uh, pericardiosynthesis in case of pulseless electrical activity, PEA. There is a major indication for emergency pericardiosynthesis is a patient in cardiac arrest with PEA. You should always consider cardiac tamponade as the differential diagnosis for the PEA. If we see the jugular venous pressure is elevated or pericardial effusion is demonstrated on the ultrasound. Now, talking about the contraindications of pericardiosynthesis. Regarding the absolute contraindications, there are none unless if the patient is severe uh, hypotension or hypoperfusion is evident or if the patient is in cardiac arrest, then there is uh, no use of doing pericardiosynthesis. Next, coming to relative contraindications, uh, the coagulopathy profile, if the patient is uh, having a prosthetic heart wall, patient is having pacemaker and cardiac devices or if there is any lack of direct visualization that is by the ultrasound during the procedure or if there is a, a cause of the pericardial pericardial effusion is a traumatic, then we rather prefer thoracotomy rather than pericardiosynthesis. These are the relative contraindications of pericardiosynthesis. Now let's talk about the equipment required for pericardiosynthesis. As you can see in this image, these are all the required instruments required for the pericardiosynthesis. Of all these components, the most essential is the ultrasound machine, which is first used to determine whether a pericardial effusion is present, then assists in accurate needle placement also. Ideally, we use a probe with a small footprint and a frequency of 2 to 4 millihertz. If this type of probe is not available, then we use 2 to 3.5 pervilinear probe in the sub zipoid view. This also will be providing excellent images of the heart. Right now, we are using, with the advanced technology, we are using the ultrasound guided pericardiosynthesis. Previously, we, they have, we were able to do with electrocardiographic monitoring. In this, one of the precordial leads, like V1, is attached to the distal end of the spinal needle with the alligator clamp. The precordial lead can then be used as a rhythm strip to monitor the needle tip continuously. As you can see in this image, we have chlorexidine first uh, creating a sterile field. Then we can place the sterile drip. We take a local anesthetic as shown lid lidocaine and to load it 10 ml syringe or 25 gauze needle and then 60 ml syringe per hour pericardiosynthesis with 18 gauze spinal needle and to run over it a dilator and uh, 
if you are placing a pigtail catheter for recurrent uh, draining of the pericardial effusion, a French pigtail catheter can be used and a JIT guide wire with a three-way stop cock. And uh, if you are using the technique of uh, electrocardiographic monitoring, then the ECG wire with alligator clips can be used. Now, let's discuss about the procedure of the pericardiosynthesis. Initially, we need to be doing a temporizing measures. Cardiac tamponade is an emergency that requires urgent therapy. Therapy typically consists of either pericardial drainage by needle aspiration or placement of a pericardial window. These procedures are not classically performed in DD. So, temporizing measures are the mainstay of therapy unless the patient is unstable like in PA arrest. The most common therapeutic procedures used as temporizing measures is the setting of tamponade or intravascular volume expansion crystalloids and administration of suppressors or inotropes like norepinephrine, isoprotonol, dopamine or dobutamine. Norepinephrine and isoprotonol increases cardiac output in animal models of tamponade but fail to increase it in humans. Dopamine and dobutamine increase cardiac output in improved hemodynamics in the settings of the tamponade. Any of these agents may be beneficial as a temporizing agent only but theoretically dobutamine is preferred because of its greater beta adrenergic activity. Regarding preparation, before preparing for the pericardiosynthesis, place all resuscitation equipment at the bedside in anticipation of clinical deterioration. Now, positioning of the patient, you need to elevate the chest 30 to 45 degrees to bring the heart closer to the chest wall. Sedation of the stuporous patients is typically foregone because of the risk for further hemodynamic collapse. The patient is awake and undergoing the procedure without obvious hemodynamic compromise, short-acting medications such as ketamine, midazolam or fentanyl are preferred. Every effort should be used to ensure a septic technique. Prepare the chest and upper part of the abdomen with chlorhexidine-based solution and then drape the patient and ensure that all care providers involved in the procedure are wearing a sterile hat, mask, gown and gloves. The patient is awake, anesthetize the same skin and proposed route with 1% lidocaine solution. Because the pericardium is extremely sensitive, it should be thoroughly anesthetized. The approach to the pericardium senses depends upon the clinical status of the patient and availability of the ultrasound. Ultrasound is best uh, used for localization and deciding the approach. Pericardial synthesis with ultrasound guidance is currently the safest and most reliable method for diagnosis and treatment of pericardial effusion and tamponade. Studies of echocardiography directed pericardial synthesis have found that epical approach is the best site for puncture. And we have seen that there is greater safety with an epical approach. However, the studies also reveal that the epical approach is associated with greater incidence of pneumothorax than a traditional subcostal approach. Next, regarding the approach, we can either use ECG monitoring guided or ultrasound guided. If the ultrasound is not readily available, then we can use electrocardiographic monitoring to prevent puncture of the ventricle. In this technique, we need to make sure that there is an extra assistant who will ensure sterile technique and observe for the dysarrhythmias and make sure that the ECG machine is functioning properly. After all equipment is sterile, attach an alligator clip from one of the precordial leads that is V1 to the distal end of the spinal needle. Record a rhythm strip of this lead by uh, continuously. Advance the needle through the skin while remembering that any contact with the epicardium will cause a current of injury pattern, which can be seen in the ECG. Typically, this current of injury pattern is represented as white complex premature ventricular contraction with an elevated ST segments, which is caused when the needle is touching the epicardium. Withdraw it several millimeters to prevent laceration of the myocardium or coronary vessels. After slight withdrawal, the needle should be within the pericardial space. Aspirate any fluid but watch for changes on the ECG. Electrocardiographic monitoring is not useful if the patient has an abnormal myocardium from conditions such as previous MI or the formation of the scar tissue. So there will be no current of injury pattern will be generated on the rhythm strip. Next coming to the ultrasound guided pericardiosynthesis. Ultrasound guided pericardiosynthesis has been traditionally performed blindly. Pericardial synthesis has been traditionally performed blindly and this approach is associated with low risk success rate and high risk of complications. So now using ultrasound to both diagnose and guide the pericardial synthesis has resulted in increased success and lower risk of the complications. So, depending upon the approach, we require to change the positioning of the transducer. In the sub ziphoid approach, we place the transducer just inferior to the ziphoid process in the midline. Here, the indicator is faces the patient's right side. To obtain the best image possible, it is best to place the hand over the transducer and press down into the epigastric area. The transducer can then be aimed towards the left side of the chest until the heart comes into view. The depth may need to be adjusted to view all four chambers of the heart as well as pericardium. Next, in the parasternal approach, we have to place the transducer to the left of the patient's sternum in the 4th to 5th intercostal space. The indicator should be pointing towards the patient's right shoulder. Slight adjustments in angle may be needed to obtain the best image of the heart. 
If the patient's hemodynamic status allows, placing the patient in the left lateral decubitus position may improve the view by moving the heart closer to the anterior chest wall and displacing the air-filled lungs. After uh, either we can use this ECG guided or the ultrasound guided pericardiosynthesis. Next is the approach. Subzifoid or the subcostal approach is the traditional blind approach which can be used for pericardiosynthesis. In this technique, we introduce the needle one centimeter inferior to the skin to the left costal angle at a 30 degree angle to the skin. Because the heart is anterior structure angle greater than 45 degrees may lacerate the liver or stomach. We need to aim towards the left shoulder and advance the needle slowly while continuously maintaining negative pressure of the syringe to aspirate any fluid. The aspirate must be in an in and out vector, not side to side, because it may lacerate the tissues. If no fluid is aspirated, withdraw the needle completely and redirect into the deeper posterior trajectory. If still there is no fluid aspirated, withdraw the needle and redirect it, working from the patient's left to right until it is aimed to the right shoulder. Next is the epical approach. Epical approach is occasionally used as an alternative to the subcostal approach to drain a pericardial effusion when ultrasound is available. We use ultrasound to identify the largest area of the epical effusion or simply feel for the apex. If the apex can be, be if the apex cannot be palpated, it typically lies within the area of cardiac dullness, which is between the fifth, sixth, or the seventh intercostal spaces between the mid clavicular line and the mid axillary line. We introduce the needle one centimeter lateral and into the intercostal space below the apical heartbeat. Then we advance the needle over the upper border of the rib and aim it towards the right shoulder to avoid the neurovascular bundle, which is usually located at the lower border of the rib. This area is close to the lingula and left pleural space, thus making pneumothorax a frequent complication. Theoretically, this technique is used because coronary vessels are small at the apex. Therefore, if ventricle is entered, it is a thick wall left ventricle which is more likely to seal off after ventricular injury. With echocardiographic guidance, that is the ECG guidance, the epical approach is most commonly used. Next is the parasternal approach. In the parasternal approach is an alternate approach for the above mentioned approaches. First, we identify the largest area of the parasternal effusion and ultrasound if possible. And then we introduce the needle one centimeter lateral to the sternal border at the left fifth or sixth intercostal interspace. We advance the needle over the upper border of the rib to avoid the neurovascular bundle which is located in the lower border of the rib. Then avoid going too far laterally from the sternal border because of the potential injury of the internal memory artery. Occasionally, the right parasternal approach may be used when the ultrasound predicts superior access to the effusion from this direction. The ideal site for skin puncture is where the largest area of fluid accumulation is closest to the skin surface. On ultrasound, this is indicated by large anechoic, there is a black area at the top of the screen, usually corresponding to the left anterior chest wall, rather than the subcostal region. This approach also avoids injury to the liver, which is common with the subcostal approach. Inadvent puncture of the lungs is also prevented with this approach because aid in the lungs will not conduct sound waves and will prevent visualization of the heart when located immediately beneath the probe. Avoid choosing a site that could puncture the internal memory artery which lies 3 to 5 cm from either parasternal borders. Or even avoid in neurovascular bundles which is located at the lower border of the rib and we need to mark this site with the sterile pen. Next, the procedure and the technique. After we confirm the trajectory and depth of the needle, before puncturing the skin, we should be aware that the repositioning of the patient alters the position of the heart and pericardial sac within the chest. So, reassessment will be necessary. Prepare the skin antiseptically and place a sterile cover over the ultrasound probe. If time permits, then you can anesthetize the selected area with 1% lidocaine and uh, with the superior border of the adjacent trip being used as landmark. We select an 18 gauze spinal needle. This have a wish, ideally take an 18 gauze needle with a sheet that allows it to be withdrawn after the pericardial space is entered. This helps avoid injury to the heart and other vital structures. We attach a saline filled syringe to the needle and gently aspirate while slowly advancing the needle and we keep the ultrasound probe on the chest wall immediately adjacent to the aspiration site. Once the pericardial space is entered, inject agitated saline to confirm needle placement, particularly if the pericardial fluid is grossly bloody or if there is any question about the needle in place. We prepare this uh, uh, saline echocardiographic contrast medium by using two 5 ml syringes, one with saline and other with air. We connect them with a three way stop cock to the needle and the catheter. We rapidly inject saline between the syringes and inject it into the sheet. We monitor the entrance of the agitated saline into the pericardial space sonographically. It appears as brightly echogenic stream. If the use of agitated saline proves to be inconclusive or suboptimal, you can use an echocardiographic contrast as a safe and successful alternative. Contrast agents contains gas micro bubbles, which markedly enhance the fluid echo by introducing multiple liquid gas interfaces. Inject the solution as a bolus. The contrast material clears immediately after administration or if persists temporarily within the cardiac chambers, then it, the intracardiac location is suggested. Next step would be the fluid aspiration and evaluation. 
removal of even a small amount of pericardial fluid 30 to 50 ml usually results in either return of spontaneous circulation or hemodynamic improvement. After any approach used for pericardial sensors, place a temporary drain not only to ensure rapid access into pericardial sac but also to allow more fluid to be removed quickly if hemodynamic collapse reoccurs. After this needle placement is confirmed, temporary drain can be placed by cell danger technique, which is first we remove the syringe from the needle and then we advance a guide wire to the needle. Then we remove the needle. Then we position a dilator, which in this case is 6 to 8 inch cordless over the wire. Then if the, in the dilator is not used, particularly with the subsified approach, the pigtail catheter may get caught in the subcutaneous tissue and make placement of catheter difficult. We remove the dilator and slide an introducer sheath over the wire. Remove the wire and the dilator while leaving the introducer sheath in place. Then we insert the pigtail angio catheter through the introducer sheath and aspirate fluid to confirm placement. After the catheter is advanced into place, secure it with suture to ensure that it does not migrate after the procedure. Then we apply an appropriate catheter dressing and we attach the catheter to a three-way stop cock and connect it to water seal to drain the gravity. The pigtail catheter allows prolonged drainage and safe access into the pericardial sac without requiring the introduction of another needle. If drainage of the pericardial fluid becomes sluggish, flush the catheter with heparinized solution to ensure patency of the lumen. Next, during the puncture, there can be aspiration of blood or the uh, pericardial fluid can be bloody. So, to differentiate between them, there are several simple laboratory tests that can differentiate normal from abnormal pericardial fluid. Under normal conditions, pericardial fluid is less than 50 ml in volume and clear to pale yellow in color with no red or white blood cells and no inflammatory markers, bacteria or cancer cells and the glucose concentration is similar to that of blood. And immediately after the procedure, we need to take a chest x-ray to ensure the absence of pneumothorax and free air under the diaphragm. We have to place a patient under continuous cardiac monitoring for 24 hours and watch for signs of reaccumulating fluid or hydrogenic complications. Repeating the ultrasound examination for 24 hours is recommended. The diagnostic evaluation of non-hemorrhagic fluid is similar to that of the pleural fluid. Next, we suture the pigtail catheter to the skin, but be careful not to occlude the catheter by tying it too tightly. Wrap the catheter in gauze at the skin and cover it with a sterile dressing and attach the catheter to suction tubing and drainage system. And then finally, talking about the complications. With the advent of the ultrasound and CT-guided pericardial synthesis, the complication rates had been greatly reduced. And because pericardial synthesis is performed in moribund patients, the likelihood of cardiac arrest and death is high. However, they are not usually a direct complication of pericardial synthesis, but because of poor cardiopulmonary result. Cardiac arrest and death are rarely associated with echocardiographically guided pericardial synthesis. When blind or electrocardiographically guided pericardial synthesis is performed, the patient is usually already in full arrest attributing the cause of death to the procedure is nearly impossible. Now, one of the most frequent complications is a dry tap, especially when a blind approach is used. A dry tap is often caused by blockage of the needle when clotted blood or skin plug. With a parastinal approach, the needle can become blocked by vigorous uh, probing of the anterior costal cartilage. The problem can be solved by repositioning or irrigating the needle, which allows the effusion to be aspirated unless it is loculated. Next, complication would be a periventricular contraction or the arrhythmias. However, these are no serious dysarrhythmias resulting in hemodynamic compromise. And uh, other would be a liver, risk of liver laceration, which is most commonly seen in the traditional sub approach. There can be uh, pneumothorax or pneumopericardium which is most commonly seen in the parasternal and epical approaches. The other would be the uh, very few studies have reported ventricular or coronal vessel laceration during the pericardial synthesis. In patients taking anticoagulants, it is important to check coagulating factors and monitor them closely after seemingly insignificant pericardial synthesis because hemopericardium can be developed from the procedure itself. And most ventricular punctures involve the lower aspect of the right ventricle. The wall of the right ventricle is thin and therefore vulnerable to laceration. However, pressure in right ventricle is low, so a puncture should cause little bleeding. And another complication is pulmonary edema following pericardial synthesis. It is presumably caused by a sudden increase in venous return to the left ventricle when peripheral vascular resistance is still high from compensatory catecholamine secretion. So, Many people recommend that the pericardial drainage rate should not exceed 50 ml. So, this is the complete uh, procedure regarding pericardial senses. Hopefully, you had a great time understanding this procedure. Thank you.
and this is Naveen, uh, emergency medicine PG second year.